Uh, Jesus didn't have a problem with people that's in the streets. He had a problem with religious people. How can I help anybody when I'm not even when I was not even able to help my own son? I would never do that. I would never do that. And I became that in a matter of minutes when they took my pain pills away. And I said, I'm not where I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. Ugh. This is Faith in Your Recovery. I am Randy Davis. Welcome to the battle. Thanks again for joining us here at Faith in Your Recovery. We're glad to have you with us. Have something special for you today. Have a good friend here with us that's going to tell us her story and touch on the story of her brother as well. Jackie Sheridan, welcome to Faith in Your Recovery. Well, howdy. Thank you. Good to have you with us. Glad you're here. Did you have a safe drive over from the big state of Ohio? Yeah, I sure did. It's a little colder than I would not like today, but hey, no snow and ice, so I'm good. <laughs> All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess you've got cold weather there as well. You didn't escape it. Nope, unfortunately not. Yeah, doggone it. Okay. And have you been out on the, uh, on the bike? Uh, lately or is it kind of off season a little off season we were we actually took a bike ride on christmas day and then about a week later where'd you go (laughs) just around the lake there in salina so just close to home but it was a nice little hour and a half trip you guys are gonna say just around the lake's a pretty good (laughs) hike there isn't it it is yeah yeah. grand lake st mary's well thank or salina depending on what side of the lake (laughs) you live on i always get to hear about that Jackie, you and I, uh, we've been friends for a long time. We've experienced a lot of different things together. But I know in your personal life, you've experienced a lot as well. I want you to share with the folks here who Jackie was, what she was about in her early years. Oh, wow. (laughs) Well, um, I was a very different person then than what I am now. Um, I experienced a lot of childhood trauma. Um, you know, we, uh, we grew up in, uh, Western Jay County, um, and my mother battled addiction and mental illness. Uh, there was a lot of drugs in and out of our house. Uh, there was a lot of people in and out of our house. Uh, I was molested for years. Um, when that came out, um, you know, uh, nothing was ever done. It was one of those things, just keep your mouth shut because what would the neighbors think? As I got a little bit older, the nightmares got too much for me and I started using. It was really easy. I didn't have to go anywhere. I could just, you know, go right into my mom's bedroom. Uh, She had a lot of prescription pills. Uh, I started drinking on top of that. It was ugly. I mean, I, I got to a point in my early years where, you know, I wasn't sober, not a single day. I was drunk or high. I know that you've talked before about that trauma that you had to go through and how easy it was there at home to obtain those drugs. But I know you also had those times where uh, you didn't dare go inside. Tell the folks a little about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, growing up, you know, um, husbands, boyfriends, whatever, um, there were, there were drugs dealt out of our house right off the kitchen table. And there were times when, you know, you get off the school bus and it didn't matter what the weather was, whether it's, you know, minus 20 out or if it's thunderstorming, uh, if there's a certain car in the v- in the driveway, you didn't go in. You knew that from an early age um, because anything could go wrong during a drug deal. So we would just sit out there and wait. Um, you know, it wasn't anything we talked about. Uh, you knew you knew from a very young age, you didn't discuss this with anyone. It was just something we lived with. It is just the way it was, right? Yeah, absolutely. It was just part of our life. And to be honest, I was I was much older till I realized, hey, this isn't normal. Most people don't live like this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know you battled some issues there. You've already said that those adverse childhood experiences, that trauma is what led you into some of your you know, your challenges and your addiction. Share that with folks, please. Uh, So, you know, after being molested for years, um, I was pretty much a very quiet person. I kind of kept to myself. I didn't want anyone in my bubble. Um, I started using, and then I started partying. The partying got worse. Ended up putting myself in a situation I couldn't get out of. I was partying with people much older than myself. I had snuck out one night, and um, I was drunk and high as normal. And uh, I got how old were you at this time, Jackie? I was fifteen. Okay. And uh, I had snuck out of my house. Ended up at a party. Uh, I was raped, but um, I already knew nobody cared. 
Um, nobody was going to do anything about it. So I just kept my mouth shut and I just started, you know, smoking more weed, doing more pills, drinking more liquor um, until it was just constant and I was not sober. So internalizing all of that, drugs became your way to at least numb it? It gave me an escape. You know, um, when, when you're high, when you're drunk, you don't feel you don't think you just exist and that's what i needed to survive at that time i i never really learned how to live i just learned how to survive how to survive world you know what a world of difference i know you've said before too that you uh you moved around quite a bit during that time school to school yes oh absolutely um by the time i was in the second grade i'd already been to uh, i think about eight different schools you know uh, because the money went to pay for drugs instead of rent or you know electricity or food uh i've said it many times i'm you know, if it hadn't been for my grandparents, uh, we would have we would have gone hungry. We would have been homeless. So then you move into those early teen years at 13, 14, 15 range and you start stepping out and stepping in the wrong direction. Yeah, I sure did. I mean, that was you know, that was my life. That was the life around me. Um, everybody that I was around was doing the exact same thing that I was doing. So it wasn't like I thought it was wrong um, or not normal. Um, it was my way of coping. It was my way of, you know, just trying to deal with everything that was happening. In your circle, that was the accepted and the normal behavior. Oh, absolutely. Like I said, everybody around me, family, friends, all doing the exact same thing. So if I go back and talk to one of your teachers from that day and age, how would they have described Jackie? Most of them probably would have said very quiet, kept to myself, didn't, wasn't really noticed, Um, I would say I probably had one teacher in high school um, who got to see a little bit of a different version. She was very supportive, very encouraging, you know, but again, no one knew what was going on in my day to day life. Nobody had a clue. I didn't talk about it. So was there was there a drug you didn't use? No, no, there wasn't. Um, Now, you got to remember back, you know, late 80s, early 90s. um, That's just when crack was just coming out. I was terrified of that. I hadn't used that. I had gotten a hold of some weed that was laced. Um, That night is truly what changed my life. Go ahead. Tell folks about that. Um, my girlfriend and I had gone out to celebrate my birthday. We were going to party and, you know, get drunk and high like we had done. Which birthday? What number? Uh, this was my 17th birthday. Okay. And uh, we had gotten a hold of a joint that was laced uh, with LSD. We didn't know that till later. And um, <laughs> I end up hallucinating for almost 48 hours. Um, it was traumatic. It was life-changing for me. I didn't really... I didn't really know God at that point in my life. My dad had, you know, attempted to take us to church when we were younger. But <laughs> let's be real, when I was little, I would just like count the lights or, you know, poke at my brother. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I remember thinking and I remember saying out loud, if you let me survive this, I'll never touch drugs again. I will break this cycle and I and I will change and I will I will live a life that I'm proud of. I never touched them after that. So you were honest to your word at that point. There's a lot of folks who want to bargain with God, but when they get their side, they forget what they promised to fulfill as part of that payback. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've all seen it. But for me, uh, that truly scared me to death that night. I thought I was going to die. I was way too young. And I just, I knew that I wanted a better life. I knew that I deserved it. And I knew at that point, this wasn't normal. This, you know, there was more to life than this. And uh, I worked really hard. You know, that addiction gene doesn't ever go away. You still battle that your whole life. Um, So it was there. You know, I, I definitely had the urges and the cravings. And there were even more traumatic years to come that would push me to the brink. Um, but no, I didn't use again. So after that, that marijuana being laced with the LSD, that was the moment that changed your future, even though there were still struggles ahead. Oh, absolutely. Yes. My life completely changed. I still had to deal with the demons. I still had to deal with my nightmares. Um, but I knew that if I could get away from where I was living, if I could get away from, you know, 
that perception of what I felt that everybody saw when they saw me. I always viewed my, you know, when people would look at me, they would just see this raggedy redhead from the wrong side of the tracks. And whether they knew my story or part of my story or thought they knew, I always felt like people were looking down on me and I knew I needed to walk away from that to create something better for myself. And you probably had some of that paranoia, even those who had no idea who Jackie was, you would look at them thinking they knew that story. Oh, you know, absolutely. Like it was written on your forehead for them to read. Yeah, yeah. I felt like I just had like this big imaginary sign above my head. Hey, here's this trashy little drug addicted hoe bag, um, you know, that uh, is never going to amount to anything. So you made mention there how you felt like you needed to get away and I know that means physically, geographically. Tell us about that. <laughs> I got this amazing opportunity. My dad knew that things were really bad for me. Uh, he wanted better for me. Uh, he gave me the opportunity for an open-ended ticket to Florida right after I graduated. And I took that. And uh, I had a suitcase full of clothes. I had 300 bucks on me. And uh, I went to Florida and I ended up fi finding a job. And I started working full time right away. Um, I met my now husband and uh, started a new life. I just never came back home for a few years. That doesn't always <laughs> work, but obviously it worked for you. And we're going to uh, to see before we're done here how that has worked. But I know there were still challenges, problems, trauma ahead. Go ahead with that. Yeah, so um, I had moved away. It was the hardest thing I had, you know, it was the hardest choice for me because I had a, you know, I had a younger brother, Gary Wade. Uh, he was, we were best friends. You know, I, I just always remember taking care of him, you know, at a very young age. Um, you know, again, my mother, she, she battled addiction. She, she battled her mental illness. And looking back now, I realized she did the best she could. At the time, I didn't feel that way, but I always knew I had to take care of him. And leaving him was super hard. I mean, he was, you know, we were only, you know, what, 15, 18 months apart. So we were super close. It was just the two of us. I'd always taken care of him. But I knew I couldn't help him if I couldn't help myself first. Um, but I knew leaving him here, he, he was already into drugs. You know, I started using at 13. And the difference between the two of us was when he started using at 13, he started dealing he wasn't just dealing to the neighborhood kids. He was dealing with grown adults that my parents were dealing with. You know, I, I'm now a mom of four and pretty certain if my 14 year old has a wad of cash and no job, I'm going to question where that money came from. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was never questioned. You know, nobody talked about it because, you know, we don't talk about those things. So I moved away and, you know, I, I, I started a better life for myself. After I got married and I had my first son, I told my husband, you know, I need to move back home. I need to be close to my dad. That gave us the opportunity to come back home. By that time, my brother, he was married and, you know, he was, um, it was about a year later, they had their first baby. And then another year he had his second baby. Um, him and his wife were struggling. They had two kids. His addiction was full blown. I got a phone call one night. Uh, it was about three o'clock in the morning. I was pregnant for my second daughter and it was the Union City Police Department. And the one thing that we all know about anybody who battles addiction, they are the greatest salesperson in the world. Absolutely. I mean, they can sell you anything at any given time. And he had convinced this police officer, call my sister, she'll come and get me. And, you know, there's this was a night I was, you know, very, very pregnant. Uh, there were flash flood warnings, tornado warnings. I had to call my husband. He worked third shift. And I said, I need you to come home and set with the baby. I've got to go get my brother. And of course, he was not happy about this because, you know, of all the, the weather threats. And sure. But he knew I was going to go. He knew this was my brother. And that's just what it was. And so I got down there and uh, the police officer said he has two choices. He can go with you and you can be responsible for him or he's going to jail. You know, by the grace of God, he was not injured when he crashed his car that night. Uh, but I told him, I said, you, you got two choices, buddy. I said, you're going to, to jail tonight or in the morning, in the daylight hours, you're going to go to rehab because you deserve something better. Your wife, your babies deserve something better. And he agreed to it. And it was amazing because he uh, he went to rehab 30 days clean and sober. You know, this was the first time he had been clean and sober since he was 13. And I was so proud of him. Uh, but unfortunately, we all know when you come back home, everybody's still doing the exact same thing, you know, and, and not everybody has that luxury of packing up and moving away. So, you know, he knew he was going to struggle. 
And it was probably, I don't know, maybe a month later, he calls me up and he says, hey, big sister, guess what I've done? And I said, well, hell, I have no idea because Scott only knew. (laughs) Right. And uh, he said, I joined the Army today. I will never forget that phone call. I was so proud of him. I was so proud of him knowing that he was fighting to break that cycle. He was fighting to give himself and his family a better life. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. Um, but again, we all know that addiction gene doesn't leave us. Um, he went in full-time military and, well, alcohol, it's, it's part of their culture. It is what it is. So he traded one addiction from the other, but he was a functioning addict, right? I mean, still went to work every single day, took care of his family. He was a great husband, a great dad, um, a great uncle. Oh my gosh, my kids loved him. <laughs> um, but part of... Part of being military is war, and war is ugly. Uh, his first deployment, everything was fine. Second deployment, we noticed things were a little off. We noticed his addiction was getting a little worse. Um, I started getting those random two, three phone, you know, two, three a.m. phone calls again, babbling, rambling, you know, nothing ever made sense. And then his third deployment, um, there was an IED explosion. Um, he had a traumatic brain injury. He came home. He was just, he was never the same person. Uh, The VA had him so doped up. It was terrible. And watching someone you love turn into somebody that you don't recognize is gut-wrenching because there's nothing that you can do to save them. You can love them. You can encourage them. You can fight for them. But at the end of the day, they still have to fight for themselves. And, you know, when uh, the prescription pills got taken away because he was abusing them, he turned to street drugs. I, he started, you know, coke and heroin and meth and anything he could get his hands on. And I just watched this incredible person's life get turned upside down. I mean, he lost every single material possession he owned. Uh, he lost his wife and, you know, he lost custody of his kids and um, he became homeless. You know, he would couch surf and stay in abandoned places or, hey, somebody knows someplace he can stay here and there. Uh, it was terrible. How how did you deal with that? Di- how did you get involved? Because I know you did. I know you. <laughs> Tell the folks, you know, what your thoughts were, your involvement, your support, or your stepping away. You explain it. I wish I could tell you that I was the best sister in the world, but I wasn't. Of course, I was involved. This was my little brother. It was just the two of us. And I loved him. And I knew that deep down inside, there was this incredibly amazing person and so full of love. And he would have given anyone anything. I mean, if if you came up to him and you needed a dollar and that's all he's had, he would have gave it to you. That's who he was. I, I tried to help him fight. I was, I was hard. I wouldn't let him come and live at my house. I was trying to help his ex-wife, you know, take care of the kids because she was working all the time and, you know, and the kids were little. So I had my four kids and then, you know, her three kids by now and working a full-time job. And uh, I was going crazy. I felt like I was losing my mind. I never turned my cell phone off. I was always afraid I was going to get that phone call. Um, in the middle of this, my oldest son joined the military ended up on the deployment, the exact same place where my brother was injured. That was terrifying. (laughs) Um, You know, I'd go days without sleeping just because my brain just didn't want to turn off. I was always so afraid I was going to miss that phone call. You know, there would be times that he would, you know, he would call his, his daughter and, you know, beg her for money. And she would call me and she'd be crying and saying, Aunt Jackie, please make him stop. And I would just get so angry with him. And I remember one day I had I had just had enough after getting a phone call from my niece where she's crying and I tracked him down. <laughs> he was over in, uh, I don't know, Hartford City or Upland at the time. And I found him and we're screaming at each other just face to face. And, you know, I, I said, I said one of the worst things you could ever say to somebody. And I told him he was nothing but a worthless junkie. And I said that because I was, I was angry and his children were hurting. My children were hurting. I knew he was hurting, but I just, I just thought for one second, maybe, maybe if I just make him mad enough, maybe he'll see what the rest of us are seeing and he'll, and you know, he'll, he'll get that image of his children crying or, 
my children crying or realizing, you know, what all of us are going through as we're watching him kill himself. And because it literally, that's what it is. And, you know, you, you can't stop it. And needless to say, he didn't see it that way. He was, he had a few, few, uh, names for me. (laughs) Um, it was ugly, but the one thing that my brother and I always had, no matter how mad we were at each other, (laughs) and I know it sounds ludicrous, but we would always hug each other and say, I love you before we left. Always. Even if we're screaming at each other on the phone, it'd be like, okay, I'm done. Bye. I love you. And we just hang up because I always wanted to make sure that if something happened, that was the last thing I said to him. That's powerful. (laughs) We need to take that to heart. We can hate the moment, better not hate the person. Uh, We can hate the situation, but we don't have to hate that person. And I think that's what I'm hearing you say right there. And to think that you could walk away knowing with all the anger and everything else you felt, the love was still there. That's why you kept returning and why he would return to you and even take the risk of that moment. He was in the military. Uh, There was the explosion. He came home. I know you got a couple of calls during that time that you haven't mentioned yet, like the one going over to the house or the one when he was there in the hospital making those promises. Tell us about some of those. So the very first call that I had gotten from him was in the middle of harvest. Um, I work in ag and anybody who is a farmer or knows ag at all know that uh, you work really long hours and uh, you don't leave unless it's an emergency. And um, I was over on the east side of Dark County. That's where I worked at. And I had gotten a text message that said, hey, big sister, I need you now. I've taken too much. I don't know if I'm going to make it. He didn't even have minutes on his phone for me to call him. And I remember thinking, I have to get to him right now. And I can't call the police because there was no address. I mean, this was basically an abandoned building. And I kept thinking, okay, so if I call 911, what am I going to tell him? Like, okay, I know when I come into Hartford City, I turn right after the tracks. And then there's a blue house. You turn left. And then, you know, at the gas station, you turn right. And then, you know, down. they would have thought I was crazy. Um, so I just, I told my boss, I've got to leave right now. And I got to him and, uh, thank God he was still alive. And I took him straight to Marion to the VA and I was so disgusted. Uh, they wouldn't help us. Uh, the doctors and the nurses said, we can't help him. He can't pass a drug screen. I said, he's ODing. I know he can't pass a drug screen. We wouldn't be here if he could. Well, bring him back in 24 to 48 hours, and if he can pass the drug screen, then we can put him in rehab. That, that doesn't help me in 24 to 48 hours. He'll be dead. And I was terrified because nobody would help us, and I didn't know where to turn. There, there weren't places like Brianna's Hope. Um, and even at that time, people still barely talked about addiction. Um, I was so scared, and I remember just being so angry and crying, and he says, it'll be okay, big sister. I'll be fine just take me back. (laughs) And I remember thinking, how selfish am I? I have a home that has heat and beds. And I'm letting my brother basically be homeless. But I just couldn't do it because I was so terrified that he would bring drugs into my house around our children. And I couldn't do it. So I took him back to where he was and I dropped him off and I cried all the way home because I there was nothing else I could do. And I live with that. I have to live with that every single day. But until you're in that position, you don't know what you would do. You don't know how that affects you and and the things that you know could happen. A few months had gone by. Um, During this whole process in April of 2013, our mother had passed away and um, they were super close. The two of them, her and I were not. We did not have a good relationship. That's not a secret to anyone. Uh, but the two of them were super close. And when she passed away unexpectedly, it, it changed his world. And at the same time, our dad was going through stage four cancer. We knew we didn't have much time left with him. And I just, I started to see the beginning of the end. Um, he was never, he just, he couldn't stay sober for a single day. A few months after that, our dad had passed away. 
And I remember being so angry at him because he showed up at my dad's memorial service so high. He didn't even know what day of the week it was. And I was furious with him. I was livid. And I said, one day, you can't give your family one day of being clean. I I, I was disgusted. I was angry. I still loved him. Um, His heart was breaking just as bad as ours. But I was just so mad at him that day. And I remember before he left, I begged him. I said, I can't do this again. You're the only one I have left. I'm begging you to fight. There are so many places you can go. I'm begging you to get help. Your children deserve their dad. And uh, he said, I love you. And he left that day. And, you know, even as much as we would argue and fight, uh, we did. We loved each other unbelievably. And we would still message each other every day. A few more months had gone by. And uh, I got another phone call hey, sister, I don't think I'm going to make it. So I went and got him. And this time I took him to the Marion VA and I refused to leave there until somebody helped us. And uh, it took us eight hours, two doctors, six different nurses. (laughs) Um, But I refused. I said, somebody has to help us. You know, he fought for his country. He deserves to be helped. Um, They decided to help us, not because of his addiction, but because he had contracted hep C, Uh, sharing dirty needles and uh, his liver was bad Um, it was it was shutting down Uh, he was yellow I remember his tongue was this really weird orange yellow color and he was sick Uh, we found a hospital in Fort Wayne that was willing to take him and I went with him and uh, if you've never watched anyone detox consider yourself grateful it is tragic Uh, One minute he was yelling and screaming and cussing at me. And the next minute he's telling me I'm his guardian angel. um, And he's so thankful for me. Um, I watched him puke on himself. I watched him urinate on himself. I watched him scream and holler. Uh, He finally went to sleep after about, I don't know, 12 or 14 hours. He finally slept. And uh, I told the nurse, I'm going downstairs just long enough to get coffee. If he wakes up and he doesn't see me, he's going to freak. Please tell him I just went to get coffee. And when I came back up, he was on his phone. And you know how in your gut you just know. You bet. You know something's going on. And I said, uh, Gary Wade, let me have your phone. Nah, he wouldn't do it. And I knew he had texted the girlfriend. I knew in my gut that he had asked her to bring him some drugs. I told him, I said, if she's coming up here, I'm leaving. I'm not going to watch you kill yourself anymore. I can't do this. I can't bury another one. You know, we've buried both of our parents two years in a row. I can't lose you. I can't watch this. And uh, he begged me not to go. I went, I told the doctors and the nurses who this person was, what they were bringing in. Security was alerted, but security told us, I'm sorry, we can't stop her. We have no reason to search her. Um, He's the patient. And if he wants her in here, we can't stop that. And I was livid. I I felt like I was trying to fight for his life and, and everything was going against us. When she came in, I told him, I said, you got two choices. She, one of us is leaving and he's begging me not to leave him. I gave him a hug and a kiss and I told him I loved him. And I said, I'm begging you to fight. I said, you have been through the worst. You can make it through this. And the nurse was in there begging him not to leave not to take anything just to keep fighting like he had he had gone through the physical detox now it was mental and he wouldn't make her leave so i left and as i was walking out of his room he's screaming jack please don't leave me i love you but i walked out it was the longest drive from fort wayne i had ever had in my life i knew i was going to lose him It was probably the longest time we had gone without talking to each other. It was probably about 30 days later, I got a call from him. He had checked himself into a VA uh, VA rehab place in Fort Wayne, and I was so proud of him. And I went to see him, and I told him, you know, I loved him. I was proud of him. I was getting ready to have a major surgery. I wasn't going to be able to drive for a few weeks, but if he needed anything, he could still call me, and Tim would take me to him. And it was about four days after my surgery, I got a phone call from him and uh, I knew, I knew he was using again because he said, why haven't you been to see me? I said, I told you I had surgery. I couldn't come up. I didn't know you had surgery. 
I said, when's the last time you used? And he got so mad at me. Why do you always ask me that? So because I know you well enough. He became homeless again for a few months, couch surfing with people. Finally, towards the end of May, 1st of June, the VA helped him find a house in uh, Albany. We're so proud of him. June 1 was his birthday, so I had gone over to see him, and uh, we went grocery shopping, and uh, we spent a couple hours together, and I told him I'd be back the following week to see him. It ended up being almost two weeks before I could get over there, uh, but I went to see him, and I took him grocery shopping, and we, we went out to eat, and I remember we were sitting in McDonald's over there, and uh, he was twitching. He was jerking. He was having some withdrawals. You know, he was super paranoid. And he said, we need to leave right now. I said, why? He said, because they're talking about me. And I didn't realize it because I just had tuned everybody out. But he was right. There were people who were who could visibly see the the addiction. They could see the struggle. Yes. And uh, but what they not a single person saw was his veteran hat that he wore every single day. Nobody saw that. They saw the drug addict. They didn't see the dad. They didn't see the brother. They didn't see the uncle. They didn't see the soldier. They saw an addict. They didn't see a person. No. They saw a thing. Yeah. And it was terrible because I never realized that how loud those whispers were before. So I took him home and uh, we sat there for a couple more hours and we talked about, you know, growing old and watching our babies grow up. I gave him a hug and a kiss. I told him I loved him. And I took this ridiculous selfie of the two of us. He was so annoyed. <laughs> he said, you and your selfies, you're driving me crazy. Uh, but I knew I needed it. Uh, that coming weekend was Father's Day weekend. He was supposed to pick up his youngest son. He didn't. He wasn't returning anybody's phone calls. Sunday was Father's Day. Still didn't return anybody's phone calls. And I knew in my gut something was wrong. Uh, Monday morning, I got the phone call from his ex-mother-in-law and she said, Jack Bub's gone. I said, okay, where did he go now? And she's like, no, Jack, rumor has it, Bub is gone. I said, what do you mean? She said that he's, he's OD'd. I left work. I called the Albany Police Department. I had to leave a voice message. I called the Delaware County Sheriff uh, to see what I could find out. I called the Delaware County Coroner and I got about halfway to Albany when the uh, Albany police officer called me and confirmed they had found him that morning OD'd in his apartment. I had to, I had to call his ex-wife at work so she could go get the boys. Uh, his daughter was living with me. I had to go pull her out of a factory and tell her she was never going to see her dad again. And <laughs> this young girl looks right at me and she just knew I didn't have to say a word. And this poor little girl, she just puked everywhere. It was just too much. And to sit with my niece and nephews for the next couple of days planning a funeral it was terrible. It was it was just awful. They you know they were too young. They shouldn't have had to experience that. Jackie, tell the folks what his last moments were like that you're aware of. Obviously, you weren't there, but you do know by some of what took place how his final moments played out. So, um, ended up working with the Albany. Uh, police officer I had they they discovered his body because somebody was had broke in that morning to get the rest of the drugs out of the house before his body was found and somebody drove by seeing somebody sneak in the window and that's how he was discovered and so hold it somebody was with him the night before at least one somebody and I believe there's reason to believe there were multiple ones and the way his body was found, they didn't call it in that he had passed out or that he had died. They were breaking back in to get the drugs they had left there the night before. That is true. So, you know, he always said he had what he called ride or die buddies. And I know a lot of people use that comment. I despise it because, you know, his buddies rode off into the sunset and left him to die alone. What I do know, and this is what gives me peace is that a lot of people didn't realize this, but my brother had been saved and baptized and he believed in God. And he told me every single day that we would talk for the last year of his life that he prayed that God would take this away from him. Well, God did take this away from him, not the way that we wanted to, but I know he's no longer suffering and he's no longer battling those demons. And uh, it just so happens when I was at the police department, 
I look on the computer screen and there was um, a folder of pictures, um, an icon on the desktop that had my brother's name. And I told the police officer, I want to see those. And he said, I'm sorry, ma'am, we don't show those. I said, you don't understand. Drugs have been a part of my life since the day I was born. I have lost too many family members to drugs. I need this for closure. I need to see those photos. And he said, you need to understand we have to take photos, you know, when we come in and we find a body. I said, I know, but something's telling me I have to see this. My brother was found on his knees, his elbows on the bed, and his head in his hands. And it looked like he was praying. And at that very moment in time, I knew, I knew exactly what he had prayed for. And I knew that God had answered his prayers. And that's what gives me peace because I know he's safe and I know he's free and he deserved that. Folks, I don't know what your faith tells you. I don't know how you read some of the scriptures. I don't know what your takeaway is, but I know what my takeaway is from this moment, this story. God doesn't always work in the way we want him to. God always works. We may not see it. Doesn't mean he's not working. He may not bring our healing when we're in this body, but there's a far better healing awaiting us all. Nobody wants to lose a loved one, especially through, through this kind of struggle and turmoil and hurt and loss. But I too knew Gary, and uh, he was a friend. Uh, I saw that conflict within him, and we tried, as so many did. But as you know, it belongs to them. We can only offer. <laughs> it's like, here's a gift. You've got to reach out and take it. Gary was a gift to us. And those last moments, let that define who he was. Instead of that mumbling in McDonald's, I'm not picking on McDonald's. That just happened to be the location that day. But recognize and realize God sees us on the inside out, though we see people just on the outside. We don't know what's going on in their minds and hearts or struggles. As Jackie shared this and talked about that being her moment of peace and hope for the future, what else is there to that, Jackie? Where are you today? How's life playing out for you? Um, life is amazing. Um, I was Brianna's hope you know, had started and you gave me this great opportunity about 30 days after Gary Wade had passed away to share our story. I could have never imagined in my wildest dreams where that would have taken us to. Here we are, what, six, seven, seven years later, almost six and a half. Um, I've shared our story with thousands of people all over Indiana and Ohio. Uh, it's been amazing to, to hear other people say thank you, to, uh, to hear people say Thank you for offering us hope. I, I've lived this life. I, I've grown up the same way you did to know that you can make it out of there. You know, I graduated college. I've raised four children. This year, I'm going to celebrate 30 years of marriage to this incredibly strong man who can deal with this person. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm blessed. You know, my niece and nephews are doing incredible. Their dad would be so proud of them. And I don't think it gets any better than that. You know, we miss them. You know, uh, I've got one child or two of my oldest children were military. They followed in their uncle's footsteps. Uh, you know, his children themselves are doing so great and, and working. And, you know, his daughter graduated and she's married. His oldest son just bought a house. And, you know, you just you're so proud of them. And his baby's going to graduate here in a few months. And, you know, they're all moving on with their lives. And that's all that you can ask for. We'll never forget him. We'll always love him. And we're grateful for the years that we had. Absolutely. I was privileged and honored to do Gary's memorial service held at the, <laughs> excuse me, held at the VA cemetery in Marion, Indiana, my first one there. And just to stand there and to look out across those white tombstones and to salute the past, the present, the future. Gary McCown, I salute you today. Jackie, thank you. Thank you for sharing your heart and being raw and being real and giving folks the continued hope. Thank you. I take every opportunity as a blessing, and I'm forever grateful for that. Uh, shouldn't we all? <laughs> we All of us need to. 
listen, just those final words we like to close with so often, and I hope you'll do it. Stay in the battle.